Uh, today I'm going to talk about the ethnographic uh, methodology um, in research using an ethnographic method. I have been uh, taking this for 14 years every year at Queen's Foundation and uh, in the Oxford Center for Mission Studies and also in the Oxford Center for Religion and Public Life and in different uh, universities. So this is part of uh, the lectures that I used to do. and. Uh, you, you can always uh, read it uh, in an article, which I will share in a minute. Uh, meanwhile, I'll share this PowerPoint with you, which is available online. Um, so you can download that. A number of um, websites have uh, uploaded that. So it's a kind of using ethnographic methodology in theological research. I have done that this year, um, last year, 2021, uh, for the Queen's Foundation. Uh, what is the quality, to talk to the qualitative research, basically, it's um, in the quantitative research, we quantify people um, in terms of numbers through statistical analysis or the, the method is survey method and the interview, but in a qualitative, uh, research, we take individuals as uh, meaning makers or uh, interpreters, uh, or they construct uh, meanings uh, in relation to an object. Uh, it, it has a methodological issues. Uh, of course, we will we'll highlight that a bit later. So a qualitative research can be characterized as the attempt to obtain an in-depth understanding of the meanings and definitions of the situation presented by informants uh, rather than the production of a quantitative measurement of their characteristics or behavior. It's more um, uh, inductive, um, observing people and how they interpret and how the informant help us to interpret what the way they behave and how they interpret the situation they are in. All that comes into this qualitative uh, method uh, in research. Why do we need a method? Uh, I have already spoken in my previous um, research um, about uh, the method to collect uh, evidences using a tool and that is converted as data and then the data is interpreted uh, into uh, hypothesis and the hypothesis is proved to be true using the evidences that you have collected through the data. And we don't simply construct one hypothesis but the hypothesis from which you develop one hypothesis. And uh, so the qualitative uh, research is um, much appreciated nowadays, though nowadays many people prefer the mixed uh, methods of qualitative and quantitative um, methods. Um, so here we are. I, I just like to uh, highlight one of my students uh, in Nagaland, he did a, a research on uh, Mowat's festival. Uh, it was quite fascinating. I just simplify this research and this research is more than what I am saying here. Um, here, um, I did a research on uh, uh, the cultural ecumenism, uh, which means that uh, people in different churches, they preach uh, or speak against each other on Sundays, but during this Mawad's festival, regardless of denomination, they all come together, hold each other and dance and sing and interpret uh, the culture, the environment, the relationship, everything together. And so he makes a case that uh, the ecumenism uh, is no more, uh, is, is much more possible in the cultural space than in the church ecclesial space, which is a quite interesting. Um, uh, way of arguing. So in order to do that, he goes and observe, uh, observed 
whether uh, these things are really happening in the Mawats festival uh, or even other cultural spaces. And uh, I think he has completed and he's now a principal of college in Nagaland. And uh, these are some of the pictures of those Mawats festival and uh, the dances. So let me come back to the ethnography. Uh, ethnography is basically uh, writing about people. Um, ethnos is people, graphy is writing, uh, writing uh, on people, about people, a portrait of people, a description of particular culture, mm. uh, the customs, beliefs, behavior based on information collected through the field work. And also it is, of course, a field work uh, usually conducted by a single investigator uh, who often is expected to live uh, with and uh, lives like um, those who are studied usually for a year or more. Uh, it's uh, insider, outsider is always there. You can be part of the culture and you do not need to be part of the culture, but there are many, many biases one need to overcome. And, um, and there are many verifications and, uh, and uh, many, many substantial evidence if you're an outsider. But if you're doing ethnography on yourself, that's also a possibility, as long as you know how to wear the shoe of a researcher uh, who can look at yourself as a, a critic, your own uh, studies and highlight the, the limitations of studying yourself. And uh, those are some of those things. And uh, somebody asked me uh, uh, from Queens uh, whether I can do imagine a, a future uh, ideal culture in which can I do an ethnography? Yeah, I think it's possible. It's quite an imaginative uh, research. I think uh, uh, I was just thinking about a uh, book of Revelation, uh, where I think um, uh, John, um, the author, is. Uh, clearly describing what goes on uh, in in his vision of uh, the second coming, which is quite interesting, uh, uh, an ethnographic study of second coming, I would think. So the aim of an ethnography is unobtrusive, and it identifies the geographical and temporal coordinates. Um, uh, makes visible, uh, which is uh, very important. Sometimes it's not seen or observable normally, but it, it, the ethnographic studies makes it uh, um, visible. And, uh, and it's also inside a view of how a group manages and organizes their time. And it understands the point of view from inside the group. It also tends to identify behavior patterns and anticipate uh, to make the reader understand the perspective of the native to the culture. Uh, understand the context, complexity, and politics of social processes. Um, uh, this is the dance I did in Kenya long ago uh, when we visited the Nairobi uh, suburban areas. Uh, where uh, we just uh, were part of HIV affected community and we danced to them and uh, we observed how they were responding uh, to such an issue as a Christian community and otherwise, uh, which was quite fascinating um, along with the researchers. So the researcher participated in the dance as an insider or an outsider, observed events and took notes and recorded, uh, you can record audio visual and you can record also smell, how do you feel and the artifact used, the movement as seen, as tasted or heard. And uh, so there are many ways of recording and you can use multiple people, multiple ways of uh, technology and uh, to do that. And we can also interview people for the collection of oral text, which can be analyzed in frequency, as well as um, with the consistency 
and uh, even a group uh, verification can be done. And you have to return to verify the similarities as well. And what are the evolving themes? Uh, and you can also ask people to interpret and identify those themes. But I like to come back to the idea of culture in ethnography. Uh, culture is uh, often defined as the uh, knowledge that one needs to be part of um, a particular group, uh, the way to live or the way to act, to uh, be like a member of the group or to live like a member of the group. So the culture uh, is much more defined in the way the people uh, then the knowledge that you need to be part of that group, to behave, to act, to understand, to interpret. And uh, it's quite uh, fascinating to see um, what is the culture and cultural studies is defined as mostly the representative artifacts, or the best expression of the people, like bio is a cultural text. And uh, there are um, um, many ways of studying the culture. Uh, it's is to cultivate basically the root word means. But I here I identify uh, uh, an analog of culture to uh, for us to understand the ethnographic uh, method. And uh, here, how do we observe? Or how do we interpret? Uh, what do you see? What do you hear? What do you touch? That's where the external things that you learn or consciously done easily change. So that gives a knowledge. Uh, to some extent, it's a uh, kind of observable object, objective knowledge. Whereas uh, there are internal things below these actions. What are the beliefs? What are the values, uh, thought patterns, and myths that are internal to this? And they are implicitly learned. They're unconscious. And that's where you have to play a very interesting role as an interpreter and recognize these um, uh, signs. Uh, as well to, to, to collect them, which is a subject to knowledge. How to do that is also another tip I am giving here. What is done is behavior. What is understood as good or best uh, defines the value. And what is true uh, highlights uh, beliefs. What is real gives you value. Of course, these are uh, little simplistic questions, but still they are to some extent helping people to understand the way people behave and interpret and the way people to uh, understand and explain to us. It, it has its own constraints, of course, but still there are some ways we can collect some data on this basis. Uh, I just like to highlight this as a funny bit because um, in, in some, uh, I still remember this is one alcoholic and non-alcoholic. I immediately remember the communion table at. Uh, yeah, some theological colleges where, uh, ecumenical colleges where a non-alcoholic wine and an alcoholic wine is kept. People uh, move according to the denomination, according to their belief. And just to, just to observe a little funny fact on this. And also in the cultural boundaries, very often people cross boundaries. It's not that they all stuck to uh, one particular culture. And there are possibilities of crossing boundaries and that you need to be observed as well. And that uh, sometimes, whether it is a variant in majority or variance in minority, these people can also be crossing cultures that need to be observed. So these are very, very important. Uh, why they cross and, and how they cross can be interpreted and how they experience uh, the duality of their own identity uh, or multiple identity, uh, they call it. Uh, which is also a very interesting uh, phenomenon to observe in cultures. Uh, and, um, and so here we are, I just like to highlight that the way to observe is to what are they speaking? What are they seeing? What are they hearing? What are they touching? What are they tasting? What are they smelling? And it is quite fascinating. The many senses, as much you can observe, as much you can interpret, then you can collect the text. You do not need to go every year for this event. If you collect once or twice, and the consistency and the commonality and the themes evolving very similar. And I think that is, if you collect as much information as possible, that should provide you enough data to make a case. And uh, and. Uh, 
Uh, then we come back to uh, a particular method. I just like to use ethnography, uh, which is participant observation. And of course, we need to know what is the research issue that we are dealing with. At times, we, we think uh, that uh, as, uh, as, a, as a pastor or as a normal person, we want to solve the world's problem using a PhD thesis. Uh, that is not all about a PhD thesis. A PhD thesis is to address a particular issue of research, uh, the knowledge gap, which I was talking about in the previous video. And, and then really how that knowledge gap can be addressed through that inductive research. Uh, um, particularly, I like to speak on this. Um, I had a, one of the students coming from India to do PhD, he did PhD in three years time. And he, he had a brilliant research in his studies. And he worked on um, uh, the Dalit uh, theologies. And he, he, he realized many, much of the Dalit theologies returned um, from a kind of individuals who studied the books and the, and the people. Uh, to some extent in some ways and uh, more or less there were armchair theologists and uh, he wanted to go to people and see how do uh, some people who are in the process of empowerment uh, see their faith and link their faith to that act of empowerment that's a very interesting uh, point and when he went there and what was ideal to be Dalit theology and what was impossible. And these people were holding a middle position of interpreting their faith in terms of their empowerment. And the way they see within the whole uh, society transformative uh, effect. And that these people interpreted very nice thin middle ground of the Dalit uh, theology, which was very, very interesting. Uh, for me to observe at an early stage of his research. And so it is clearly focused on where the knowledge gap is. And when he went to inductive to, to find from people how they define their faith in the context of their activities in relation to the empowerment and how that empowerment activity helped them to interpret their faith, it is easy to further the knowledge uh, as a new something new, uh, which is uh, very pra pragmatic and practical uh, in realistic context. And uh, that makes the life easier uh, as a, as a um, research uh, in, to complete in, within a short time. But then you also need to have a universe in the research. Uh, there are many, many words that are used uh, for this. But I use the word universe. What is the research universe? We have to narrow down the research universe. Um, for example, uh, if you are doing a research in uh, Uganda, for example, uh, if you are doing in the Anglican church among the young people, you are saying teenagers, okay, 13 to 17 or 18, 19, and, uh, and within one diocese, yeah, that is the universe from that is the universe from where you collect the samples and from the samples you collect the data and once you have collected the data and you interpret you develop your hypothesis and then you you find your final hypothesis which can be interpreted to anybody within that universe that universe is 13 to 19 young people anglicans within that particular Context, which can also be interpreted to other young people in Uganda, to the Anglican uh, young people, Anglican dioceses, which is possible, but within that context, it could, it should be tested and found to be more or less true in many cases. And that is the universe. And sometimes Pauline letters or Corinthians can be universe. Within Corinthians or Romans uh, ecology, uh, if you want to do, uh, you can go for Romans chapter uh, 7, 8, and where you get a particular text within which you do your research 
as that is the universe. And uh, then samples you have to collect within the universe and then data collect and then interpret it. And uh, it is called inductive because we go to the people and find uh, the, the, uh, the, the further knowledge, uh, discover the further knowledge by being there. That is the way we get into uh, this method uh, as an inductive. Using ethnography as a theological methodology. Uh, of course, theology is a formal reflection, description, and account of religious experience. Uh, while anthropology presents the theoretical interpretation of life experience of a particular society in general, I like to say anthropology uh, can, can do the research as people's experience and studying their experience, even if it is subjective in their belief, but they don't often necessarily take God into it and they can do without God, whereas theology uh, would, would actually take the subjective uh, interpretation, understanding with God. And that is the difference. And that's what um, Douglas Davis would say. A life studies experience lies at the heart of each, but their fundamental distinction concerns the existence of God. Christian theology could not function without the belief in God, while anthropology operates perfectly naturally without it. And I think it's, it's okay for theologians to use the cultural anthropology uh, by, by bringing the uh, belief in God as part of their people's experience. And, and many cultural anthropologists take God experience as experienced and interpreted by people seriously and study them through their participant observation. They, they, many of the anthropologists would say it is the idea of God, how the people use, and it is the uh, way people interpret God and their common experience and behavior are organized around sometimes symbolic meanings like Eucharist and expectations that are attached to objects uh, that are socially valued, uh, like a church or church bells, uh, which would be quite interesting why people don't attend the church service, uh, but they come to, they are very happy to come and ring the bells. And nobody has done the analysis among these people, their behavior, what do they do after the bells? And do they say somebody say prayers or somebody is happy? And, and it would be quite interesting to do a cultural analysis, uh, cultural anthropological study on the uh, bell ringers. Mm. Assumptions that underlie the anthropological research perspective. This is one of the things I like to say. First, is, uh, it is assumed that people are uh, symbol constructing and spend a great deal of time consciously, great deal of time consciously, unconsciously, interpreting what the symbols behaviors created by themselves and others mean. And the people, you know, it's, it's not a waste of time, but the people do it <laughs> in the way how do they construct uh, these, uh, their behaviors in relation to some symbol or some uh, experience, God experience, uh, religious experience, they continue to interpret. Anthropologists gain knowledge of how people think and behave through involvement into the daily social uh, activities. Finally, it is assumed that people's perceptions and behaviors are related to their context. Of course, yes, and their context determines. And the symbolic narratives, uh, our task in theology is to examine how the faith community can construct identity through the use of a central metaphor or symbolic practices such as prayer, or by creating a symbolic narrative that tells the story of its ongoing life. Uh, such practices or stories provide symbolic power to a faith community to enable a faith community to develop an idea of itself that sustains it through time and enables it to engage with and express its distinctions from its culture. Of course, I have taken this from Elaine Graham. Um, it's quite fascinating to see uh, how people use symbolic practices and narratives uh, in their daily life. Um, even uh, in the network uh, of WhatsApp prayer group, or uh, Twitters, uh, people have formed a community and became a way of life. And that could be very interesting. 
uh, why they go in silence, why they suddenly become active, why they suddenly want to pray for somebody, some actions, some uh, country's peace. This is very, very interesting way of behaving around the prayer and around the news, around that um, narrative. And who provides the news also play a very important role in that community. And uh, uh, I've already talked about this as, as, as a uh, as a Dalit uh, theologian who has done that. And so let's come back to the uh, methodology uh, in the participant observation. Uh, ethnography, in within the ethnographic uh, field, participant observation is one method, but it should have a logic. And when students always get uh, confused between method and logic, uh, the reasons for using the method is not simply because I, I don't have any other people to do. I survey these people or I interview these people. I don't have any other methods to do, so I use this method. No, no, that's not the logic. The logic is the philosophy behind uh, the method. And I give one of the examples here. Ethnographic method is part of cultural anthropological studies. A key concept in cultural anthropology is culture. Every organization has a distinctive culture. It has a unique cognitive structure, uh, rules of moral conduct, and patterns of social interaction. These are the assumptions that we make behind this method. Uh, an anthropologist researches global culture by, by field work, which is accomplished by immersion into a society, socio-cultural environment. It is a study by doing and by analyzing. So, uh, benefits of using these anthropological methods, uh, through anthropological methods, it is possible to gain an understanding of the meanings people attribute to their actions, as well as delineate, delineate, delineate the wider socio-political and economic context in which their behaviors take place. And so, methodological principles it is natural, this is the view, that aim of social research is to capture the character of naturally occurring human behavior, and that this can only be achieved by first-hand contact within it, not by inferences from what people do in artificial settings like experiments or from what they say in interviews about what they do elsewhere. Also, it is, it's an observing the natural behavior of the people. And also, it's also discovery. Another feature of ethnographic thinking is uh, conception of the research process as inductive or discovery-based, rather than as being limited to the testing of explicit hypothesis. So the field work must be descriptive and a variety of information from different perspectives, cross-validate and triangulate uh, you know, you can have observation interviews and group uh, interviews or focus groups, program documentations, recordings, photograph, uh, use quotes, and select key informants uh, wisely. Be aware and sensitive to different stages of field works. Uh, in a nutshell, researchers must make their research goals clear to the members of the community when you are doing uh, ethnographic research where they undertake their research and gain the informed consent of their consultants to the research beforehand. It's important to learn whether the group would prefer to be named in the written report of the research or given a pseudonym uh, or to offer the results of the research if information informants would like to read it. Most of all, researchers must be sure that the research does not harm or exploit those among whom the research is done. You never met a fish without getting wet. We all start with mistakes in observation and uh, chaos. So what do you do with the text? You have to analyze, interpret, and report the findings. And you have to have a qualitative description and uh, balance between description and analysis. Analysis you must keep, you have to verify a group together, thematize, and relate to the existing theoretical framework. Uh, you, you may use some of the theories that are existing and also uh, qualitative data analysis nowadays software is available and the ground theory is something you can use 
thematic uh, studies that are you can use. Triangulation means it's a combination of one or more research methods and uh, um, it is important to use and verify and using different methods how you bring together uh, what are the common uh, areas and themes and uh, uh, other uh, uh, consistent uh, frequent observations or events observed and those sort of things. Uh, as I have already said, narrative analysis and thematic analysis, content analysis, and those things you can use to study the text that uh, you have got it through the participant observation or with the different method that you have used. So what? What did you discover? How did you prove? What is or what are your contributions? Something new to the ongoing discussion in the field that you have done your research. How did you go beyond the existing theoretical or theological concepts? and that should have been beyond the literature reviews i will do it in another video and we have to have some reflexive questions with the limitations of this method uh, is there a presentation is it enough sometimes it's always uh, that we, we end up doing a small group with an extensive study uh, because of the extensive nature of the study uh, some of the people ask questions about it is it reliable? Uh, is it repeatable or unrepeatable? Is it time consuming? Uh, what about our influence, uh, our presence um, of the research? What is what about the risk of the researchers in some countries? But there are advantages also. Deeper social interactions can be studied, valid data of people rather than researchers, open to new insights. So coming back to methodology, uh, participant observation is a tool or method that we use within the ethnographic methodology. The logic is people are interpreters of their experience and people interpret what do they use as a smell or taste or everything. And how do they interpret? Can we collect the data from their interpretation? and see what do they believe, what do they have a worldview, and how we can find something beyond what's existing in theoretical uh, uh, literature, and uh, what we can contribute as something new of people, uh, about the people writing, about the people. And this is where the PhD research is all about. And, and uh, how do we focus and how do we do literature review? I will talk in the next one. Uh, thank you for uh, listening to this.